on this webinar. Um, my name is Wolfgang Reuter. I'm leading data scientist at Alexander Tam GmbH. And um, I would like to talk about uh, the detection of um, counterfeit in images in, uh, with artificial intelligence. Um, maybe I'll start with how I came to this project more than three years ago. Um, I have a background as a journalist, and I started programming in about 2013. And in 2016, I was at an auction house, and um, the auctioner told me that he had problems with the counterfeiter. And I said, well, um, is there nothing to, to detect whether an image is, is an original or whether it's a fake um, with, with means of digital, um, with computer vision or artificial intelligence? And he said, no, I'm not aware of anything like that. And I said, well, I could try something. And um, the project evolved. And um, well, here on this image, on this first slide, you can see Wolfgang Beltracchi, who's one, one of the or probably the most famous um, counterfeiter. He was convic convicted for seven years uh, prison to a seven year prison sentence um, in, I think, 2011 or 10 or 11. And um, We'll talk about two approaches to detect fake images. Um, uh, one um, is related to, to all the works of Haki, um, and the other one is then related to uh, detect uh, fake images by uh, unknown um, counterfeiters. Um, well, here is a quote of um, Wolfgang Beltracchi, the best protection against counterfeiting would be truly infantry experts. Machine learning algorithms may be biased if you train them on biased data, but they are certainly interest free. And in many cases, for example, in painter classification, they are better than humans. Well, the first question is, where do you start? Well, I started with um, training uh, paint a um, classifier that classifies images um, according to the style of the painter. I started off with about 400 images of four painters and used various different methods like uh, Bayesian inference and um, all sorts of things. And uh, after two or three months, I realized there is no way around uh, getting into machine learning. And uh, that's what I did. And <coughs> I did all the all the courses and uh, mainly on Coursera, mainly Andrew Inc's um, specializations, and uh, developed this model uh, further. But um, to start with, we'll have to talk about the data. At the moment, there is about ten thousand and sixteen artworks by twenty artists, and there is various difficulties. Like um, the first difficulty is that the uh, style of painters change during their lifetime. I mean, in the upper row, you can see um, uh, images of um, Pablo Picasso. And I mean, the last one, the one to the very right, is clearly a Picasso. Uh, everybody would recognize that. Uh, but the first image or the second, you wouldn't necessarily associate with Picasso. And the same is true for Salvador Dali and others. Um, the second difficulty is that the style of a painter is um, reflected in, in variable techniques um, like uh, sketches, watercolor, uh, uh, paintings, prints, sculptures. There is some sculptures in this data set, but not many. There is uh, behind glass pictures or images, uh, mainly from Heinrich Kampendorf. There's oil paintings and, and many, many other techniques. The third difficulty is that the images that are used for, for training um, the algorithms um, have very different resolutions. The smallest image is 224 by 253 pixels, and the biggest one is um, almost 6,000 by almost 4,000 pixels. And um, you can see here that you lose a lot of information if the image is sort of um, uh, made smaller uh, or reduced um, here is it's sort of a 12 fold re reduction where you can see um, you know what what the information loss is um, 
And the fourth difficulty is that there's class imbalances. Um, like, uh, for example, from Max Beckmann, there's only 64 images in the data set. And from Vincent van Gogh, there's um, uh, um, 1,780 images. Um, well, this class imbalance problem can be solved, at least partly solved. And uh, in, in reality, it was also part of the project to um, sort of level out these class imbalances, uh, i.e. Yeah, I could have had more pictures from. So, how, how do you how do you go about all these difficulties? Um, the first three difficulties are ignored, and uh, as I've already sort of mentioned, there is an effective way to deal with class imbalances, which we'll see in a minute. Here's the data summary again, sort of the amount of, of images, the labels, and um, and the percentage. And you can see again that uh, here, Max Beckmann only has 0.64% uh, of, of all the images in the data set. And Vincent van Gogh, with Vincent van Gogh, it's about 18.75%. Uh, now, my, my first approach was to, to think about you know, what could be char characteristic for the style of a painter? And um, that that's just some ideas I came up with. Basically, the statistical distribution of pixels within an image, the contrasts, the size of areas of the same color, the luminance, something like the width to height ratio. Maybe certain painters have a, a, a preference for, uh, for certain ratios. Um, and so forth. And the only way to find out is by trying it out. So here is a here is a quick sort of um, summary of how a digital digital image is built up. It's basically got three channels: one for um, green uh, colors, one for blue colors, and one for red colors. And um, it's basically, in mathematical terms, it's a matrix. Um, or three matrices sort of behind each other. And if you then look at the statistical distribution of these pixels in within one piece of art, you can see that they are, um, that they have a certain distribution. I mean, for example, the red uh, pixels in, in this image around about 200 and, uh, no, 170 are, are very dominant. There is sort of uh, near nil. There is almost there are hardly any pixels, but the statistical distribution of pixels in one piece of art doesn't tell you very much. But you can um, you can draw other statistical um, measurements from these distributions. You can calculate the mean or the median, um, the standard deviation, the IQR, and maybe the skewness. The skewness is how much the um, distribution is shifted either to the left or to the right. And you can do that for um, for all the pixels in, in one image. And that still doesn't tell you very much. But if you then look at the statistical distributions, in, in, in this case, it's the mean value of the red pixels for all the images of different painters. You can, with the pure eye, see that there is um, very char characteristic um, um, shapes and forms, and you can you can by just by by the human eye see that there's differences. And these first models that um, work with extracted features from the um, from the from the images um, make use of these different distributions. And and try to um, and they try to recognize them. Um, then, apart from the statistical distribution of, of pixels, there is gradients, and um, you know maybe some of you know uh, the Sobel filter, which measures the gradient, the color gradient um, of of a certain pixel. Um, you can see that here for this pixel in the middle. Um, the gradient is calculated by minus one, the pixel to the left, 
plus nil plus um, one times the um, pixel value to the right. And that's the horizontal gradient. You can do the same with the vertical gradient. And that gives you a couple of measures. It gives you not only um, um, these two gradients, but you can calculate the size of the gradient with just uh, Pythagoras. And you can also um, uh, calculate the angle of the gradient, of the color gradient. And that's the idea behind it. And you can actually visualize these um, gradient images. And, and this, is, um, this is an illustration of it with uh, the original to the left and then the um, size of the gradient image um, to the right. And you can see that it clearly sort of outlines the contrasts where there are contrasts and the angle of the gradient image to the right, which looks a bit confusing, but the neural, nets, uh, neural networks can make sense of that. Um, then I thought, well, you know, the areas of uh, the same color and how big they are and how they are distributed are also maybe characteristic for, um, for certain painters. And here you can see left to the left uh, an image of Pablo Picasso and to the right an image of um, Monet. And it's, it's fairly clear that the distribution and the size of the areas of the same color are very different. And the only question is, how do you measure this? And my solution to this was that I um, compressed the images. And um, with the k-means clustering algorithms as a, as a pre-processing step, and basically in you can see both images in the original on the left and in the middle um, the colors are reduced to only seven colors and um, it, i find it quite fascinating that even if, even though this monet picture down here uh, in the middle has only seven colors and not 255 um, it's hardly recognizable that there is a difference to this first image now and you can also reduce the colors to two, in which case you get a sort of a two color image. It's not black and white, it's two shades of gray in a way. But um, you can then, with, an, um, with a graph algorithm, um, calculate the sizes of the um, different um, areas of same color, and you can draw um, statistical distributions and, and extract other features um, from that. <laughs> and here you can, for example, see for this image, the mean size of areas of the same color is uh, 95 pixels um, for the two image, uh, for the two color image, and for the seven color image, it's 28. And the standard deviation is 0 0.04, and you get sort of um, uh, various different um, statistical measures. And you can compare it um, the same sort of parameters for the right image and you can see that there's huge differences so that's good that's good news for training a neural network because it will it, it will have a good chance to learn the differences between the different styles of the painters and then basically um with all these data there's about 1470 um feeders extracted and um, and then the data is like always in machine learning split into a training set a validation set and the test set um, the split is 70 percent 15 percent and 15 percent the training set is used to train the algorithms um, the validation set is used to optimize them and tune the hyper parameters and the test set um, the images in the test set are never seen by the algorithm they are only used to evaluate the model at the end. Um, here are some neural networks, um, just some graphical representations. Um, what's the, what's the, um, the answers to how, how familiar people are with? We didn't start the question. If we can do it now. Ah, maybe we can do a quick survey here um, about how, how familiar people are with machine learning methods. And um, then I can uh, either go into a bit more detail or I'll sort of um, go very quickly over the technical details of neural networks. 
Yeah. Should I wait a second? Yes. Can you all answer the first question and the second as well, of course? Any results yet? Yes. Okay. Good, very good, okay. Let me just scroll down a bit. No, okay. Right, then maybe I won't go too much into the details. Where is the, yeah. Basically, what, what happens in a neural network is you put in the features um, to the left into an input layer, which uh, does more or less nothing. And then all the features are distributed. Um, all the values uh, for each feature are distributed to so-called neurons. And in each neuron, what you can see here, there is two activations. The first one is basically like a linear regression. Um, it's a linear activation, but that is then followed by a non-linear activation. And um, if I go back one side, these outputs then from the um, non-linear activation are fed into the next layer of the neural network, and there is several layers. And by that, um, neural network can can learn um, the differences and and classify um, the uh, images are put in in the form of feature vectors uh, very well. So this is again the, um, the what what happens in an, in one neuron. It's a linear activation followed by a non-linear activation, and at the end um, you get a feature vector with with probabilities. But we'll come to that in a minute. So. This is a typical learning curve um, from the first model. And you, as you can see, the model has no problem for the training set to sort of really learn the data by heart. But that's bad news in a way, because we, once it learns the data by heart, doesn't mean that it's then able to generalize on, on other data. So the, um, here the accuracy the, in the orange line is the much more relevant one, which is around or in the peak, it's I think 64%. Um, we'll see the result in a minute, and and that's how good the model generalizes. Um, yes. So here's the result um, for each painter, and overall, it's the accuracy and in, in classifying the correct painter is 64.5%, which doesn't seem very high, but it's only for the first model. And um, basically, you can improve models by um, by a method which is called bootstrap aggregation or bagging. And um, what you do then is you divide the data into five data sets, and you train five different models. And um, you then average the output of all these models. And that gives you a, a, a much better, better result. And, here you can see the um, accuracies of the various different models that I've trained in this section for, for the um, fully connected neural networks. And they're all slightly better than the first one, but um, yeah, up to 67.3%, uh, um, which isn't bad at all. But then um, the, the main sort of use of this, um, uh, of these fully connected networks is that you can actually um, find out which features are important, which features are actually sort of determining the style of a painter. And there's two methods with which you can do that. The first one is is very simple. Basically, you you take um, your training, uh, your test images, and you say, okay. Um, I take um, one, uh, one feature after the other, I set to zero, and I uh, measure the accuracy um, on the test set without a certain feature. And if the feature, if a feature is missing and the accuracy drops um, by, a, by a high percentage, um, then this feature is important, obviously, because without this feature, the accuracy is much lower. And here you can see two features. Um, um, 75 and 50, 
which uh, sort of caused the accuracy to drop very significantly. And there is another method which um, you can actually look into the um, into the weights that are learned by a neural network, and you can then determine um, which features are important uh, according to whether the uh, the, the um, according weight is very high or not. And there is a good agreement between these two methods. Um, and here you can also see that the feature 50 and feature 75 are sort of very important. So I've used both methods and, um, and then uh, tried to figure out which features are really, really important. This is only for the first model. And you can see, for example, the ratio of the um, unique pixel values to the sum of all pixels is, is very important. Um, that's a measure of contrast in a way. Um, then there is the uh, of, uh, of same color. So the cluster size for the same color images. And so you can really see which, which features are very important to determine the style um, of a painter. And if you do that with all the other models as, as well, uh, there's just a quick summary. Um, most important, um, the most important features are the number of gradients with angles in certain intervals. Um, so um, the, the angle of the um, color gradient is, is very, very important. Um, other statistical parameters that are very important are sort of associated with the, um, with the gradient size and also with the, the distribution of the Laplace gradients, which is sort of second derivative of a gradient or the gradient of a gradient. But I don't want to go too much into the details here because that's maybe more like um, from, from an uh, art historian point of view, uh, interesting. Um, basically, you can improve these models by what I've already mentioned briefly with, uh, with bagging. And, and this is a little bit more in detail. You can see the output of, an, uh, of the neural network. It doesn't tell you this is an image by Claude Monet. It says, with 93.01% uh, probability, this is an image by Claude Monet, but with 1.37%, with it could also be by Kirchner. And, and for each painter, you get an output probability. And if you average these output probabilities, um, you can uh, get much better results. It's called an, an ensemble, in this case, based on, on bagging, five different models trained on five different data sets. The actual model architecture is always the same. And um, here you see the result. You can then get up to 70.4, uh, 74.9 or 75% accuracy. But if you think about the various um, accuracies for the different models, they were between 64.5 to uh, 67.3, I think, um, accuracy. And that means you could maybe wait in, in, in the averaging, you could weight the last model with the highest accuracy is slightly more. Than, than the others, and, and you could try and, and play around with, um, with various sort of weightings. But the better approach actually is to um, use a stacking model. And basically what you do is you take the outputs of all these models and you train another neural network um, on top of it, which then learns the best weights. And if you do that, um, you actually, with this just feature extracted uh, data and, and fully connected neural networks, you get an accuracy of 78%, which isn't very high. And a much better way, actually, to deal with images um, in computer vision is um, our so called convolutional neural networks. And I won't go into the technical details of them because that will. Uh, sort of lead lead 
too far for this webinar, I think, and, and to cost too much time. But basically, um, you can use something, a method called transfer learning. So I've used a pre-trained so-called ResNet 50, um, which you then um, have to alter. And I've uh, sort of added a new top layer um, with a with an additional dense layer and um, various other layers and an output of 20 because there's 20 painters in this in this data set. <laughs> And the, maybe the only thing you need to know about convolutional neural networks is that they take um, um, images of a certain size. A ResNet 50 takes it by two, 224 by 224 pixels. And I've used an approach that others have used in painter classification as well. Um, sort of, I trained the neural network with two um, sub images of one image. Um, the first one is uh, a crop right in the center, and the second one is a randomly chosen crop. So, in in you can see how this image is then represented by these two uh, quadratic um, images. And the other thing maybe you need to know about um, convolutional neural networks is they there is no extracted features, but the pixel values as such uh, are used as the features. Um, so, the hypothesis is um, that's behind this sort of cropping of the image is that unlike in object recognition, um, the style of a painter is present everywhere in a piece of art. Um, like if you look at the left image, if you took some random crops, you're very likely to get a, a classifier to then say, well, this is a hedge, or it's a it's a forest, or it's some sort of green um, plants. Um, but it, uh, the chances that you actually detect the car are pretty low. Whereas on the right hand, in this Chagall painting, um, the style of the painter should be present everywhere. And that's actually good news for class imbalances. And that's sort of the main, um, the main way how you can improve this classifier. Because you can say, well, if I have too little image, too few images from a certain painter, I just take more crops. And the procedure of that is called augmentation. And the augmentation of the small classes is illustrated here. Um, basically, I said, well, OK, I'll, I'll um, leave out the center area because I didn't want any overlap of images and I divide the any image into sub areas where the size 224 by 224 <laughs> fits in exactly once and then I iterate through all the images of a painter with with few images in the data set and choose randomly a sub area and then choose randomly a crop from this sub area and then the area is flagged and is never used again. Um, and there's one painter, Andy Warhol actually, where the, that still doesn't lead to enough images. So um, I've set the minimum number of images to a thousand. <laughs> and um, in this case, then the center uh, area is also used, and uh, so for Andy Warhol, there are overlapping images, but um, that can't be helped. So, when you then train a first um, um, CNN model, a convolutional neural network, you get an accuracy of 79% with only um, uh, one image, with only one model, which is sort of close to what the ensemble. Um, enhanced by a bagging and stacking of the feature uh, extracted data set um, used by the um, fully connected neural networks reach, reaches. It's about, it's slightly higher, it's about, about a percent higher, but it's in, in that order of magnitude. And what you also can see is that there is rhythmic shaped curve. The accuracy for each painter is very sort of logarithmically uh, dependent on uh, the number of images, or in this case, on the percentage or the relative class size. I mean, the percentage of images of that painter, like here, this is Vincent van Gogh. Um, and, um, you know, you, you can see there is, an, uh, there is a, a 
um, connection. Um, and that's also true for the first uh, ensemble I talked about, only the first ensemble then starts down here at about 30% accuracy for the images with, um, for the painters with um, very few images in the data set. Um, now, the hypothesis is, uh, I've, I've, I've said that the paint style of a painter should be present everywhere in the image is true, but it's not 100% true. If you only look at the center crop images, the accuracy goes up by 2% to 81.3 uh, or 4, uh, 81.4%. And if you only look at the randomly, at the random crops, it goes down to 77.04, I think, or 84. Um, and this is also quite intuitively explainable, I think, because every painter will sort of, um, put more effort on the center of, the, of, of an image and the, the margins are often not even fully fully worked on and um, and that's reflected in this in this statistics. So basically you could say why should I bother with these random crops um, if the center crops are so much better? Um, yeah, you could do that and then you'd have a, you'd have a classifier which which comes up to 81 percent but then that's it, you're at the end of it. And um, basically the idea is um, that the center crops and the random crops are subsets of the data. And you could, why should you stick to two crops? You could take more crops. You could actually take 100 crops, this is what I've done, and then average the softmax output probabilities that we've talked about before. And if you do that, um, you can sort of um, improve the model drastically, but you can then, in addition, um, do something which is called cross-validation. So you take um, different, you, you join the training and validation set, and you always take different validation sets and split the data so that you have, in effect, five different training sets and five different validation sets and you train one model for each fold, and you could also average those in the end. And again, like with averaging before, you can um, replace the averaging by a stacking model, which has been done like before with the um, fully connected networks. And then you see that you get, um, um, if you then combine the two different types of models and do all the improvements that I've mentioned, you can come up uh, to an accuracy of 91.84, oh, so 91.1% accuracy, which I think is, is really pretty good. Um, now, before I talk about um, the fake images, I would like to mention that this painter classification has been ex, um, um, exposed in the museum uh, Buchheim last year, and um, visitors could sort of play, playfully play against the algorithm. And um, the, the visitors, in on average, came to an accuracy of 60% in classifying the correct painter. And um, even the museum's director didn't did, didn't manage to beat the um, artificial, artificial intelligence. Now, um, because uh, the ensemble of neural networks can detect um, um, painters so well, despite the fact that they are like Picasso, um, have very different um, phases in their art life, I thought, well, maybe, um, or it would be worth trying out um, testing images by Wolfgang Beltraki, who always faked other uh, painters. And you can see on the left-hand side images that he's drawn in the style of other painters, like here, for example, this is two Klimt's that he imitated. And he drew that in, his, in, his, uh, in, in the years after he came out of jail. And um, he didn't sign them, um, or he signed them with his name, but not in, with the fake name, and that's completely legal. Um, but they're still sort of fakes because they imitate other painters. And on the right-hand side, you can actually see 
um, images from his criminal phase, which um, were given to me by the LKA, Landeskriminalamt Berlin. And you can then train, um, you, you can then build up a data set with, with various images from, from Beltraki, altogether 164. But there were some um, images from um, the catalog Kairos, which had, um, I'll come back to that in a minute, which had sort of um, from one image, the original and the finished images on the left, the Saturna uh, imitation, it had details and it had sometimes also phases, uh, early phases of the drawing in there. So these were split um, into training tests and validation sets such that um, all images that actually belong to one final image are only found in one in one set. So either in the training set or in the test set or in the validation uh, validation set. But but these images that derive from one image are not split across different sets. Um, the reproductions were made with seven different cameras, so to avoid and bias by just that the algorithm learns a camera, they were uh, taken in different light conditions, in different locations over two days, partly with artificial light, partly with a tripod. So, you know, I tried when, when producing these images, I tried to get um, as much variability into the images with respect to cameras and lighting conditions as possible. And the other pictures, um, from the LKR, um, I, I didn't alter, I just took them like they were. And basically, if you then use the same model, and I didn't use for this particular test, I didn't use a, um, uh, the, the feature extracted data, but only the convolutional neural networks, it took the same model, um, did the same approach um, with and without uh, sort of um, Beltraki images. And what you can see is that for the uh, for for first test um, run with uh, 20 painters without Peltraki with that model, I got an accuracy of 88.16 or 17 um, uh, percent. And for the model with one more class with um, Beltraki in it as a painter, it's 88.029 percent. So. I find this fascinating because basically the model is actually um, detecting Bilchaki as a painter, despite the fact that he's always imitating other painters. And you can see that here, um, the um, accuracy com um, with respect to Bilchaki is absolutely in line with this class size. There's only 1.7% of Bilchaki images in that data set, and that's um, um, sort of rank 18 of all painters, and the accuracy is rank 19, and the precision um, is rank 8, and the F1 score, which is sort of a mixture between accuracy and precision, sort of a, a compromise value, I could say, is, is rank 16. So that's all in line with um, with just the this, just the class size, and. Um, you can see here the same, this is with the origination and detail images. Um, it, the accuracy is 87.37, um, slightly lower. Um, the detailed images didn't really help. Um, uh, the detail and, and, um, and the images from uh, phases of that uh, of, of the papers. Okay, so my conclusion from that was that um, really every painter has a particular, I call it fingerprint, some sort of um, some digital representation of his style which cannot easily be seen by humans, but uh, it, it can be detected by artificial in intelligence. And here, here's a a little bit of error analysis for models um, without detail and, and origination images. 
The, um, the red framed images are all from his criminal face. So, I mean, there are images that would have been detected by artificial intelligence, but haven't been detected by human experts. Um, then this, these are images that haven't been detected. Um, um, they are from Belchaki, they are fakes, but they haven't been detected. And these are images that are not by Belchaki, but have been uh, detected as Belchakis. But as I said, the, the um, accuracy and all the metrics are very much in line with the class size, and there is no um, significant dif uh, difference to, um, to other painters, despite the fact that he always imitated images. So Beltraki, in a way, is, is, um, is a stroke of luck for artificial intelligence, because you can do that test, but it's not the normal situation. And normally, if you want to find out whether an image is fake or counterfeited, um, you don't know who the counterfeiter was. And sort of I thought, well, maybe this can also be uh, tested with, with, with this ensemble of neural networks, um, but they have to be slightly altered. You have to take a slightly different approach because you don't know who the painter is. So um, all what's coming now is sort of, again, with the old model without the tracker images and Basically, what uh, what we've seen before is that you you get us a, a probability output for each image, um, and you can then set a threshold. And basically, here um, this is illustrated. There is uh, this is for Heinrich Kampendong. Um, you can see all the blue images are um, true originals of Heinrich Kampendong, and all the red images are fakes um, also um, given to me by the Landeskriminalamt Berlin. And um, you then just calibrate the threshold and you say, okay, if the, um, if the probability output for Kampendonk is in, in this case bigger than 0.2, um, I say this is an original and otherwise I say it's a fake. And you can see the results here. Um, all of these images are detected as fakes. Um, only this is the only one that isn't detected by fake, i.e., just as an aside, this is not um, an, a fake image by uh, Wolfgang Beltraki, it's by a different faker. Um, and all the others are detected correctly as fakes or conspicuous, I would say. Now, the downside of this approach is that you will actually um, detect some original images also as fakes or as, as conspicuous. In this case, it's three images, I think. And um, so you can calculate the accuracy on fake images. Um, yeah, for Kampendonk, it's 0.9. And um, I can't remember what the recall is for Kampendonk, but I, um, huh, it, it, it's about, 13%, I don't think I've written this down. Um, it's about 13% of the of the original Kampendongs will also be detected as conspicuous. For Pechstein, the, um, there's also images from the Landeskriminalamt Berlin. The metrics are slightly uh, worse. The accuracy on detecting fake images is only 64.3%, but you can see there's five images that are fairly similar. So maybe this is, um, sort of causing this effect. Um, the accuracy of on original images is 78.5% uh, and the wrongly classified originals would have been 12.5%. Um, for Beckmann, uh, all of the fakes from the Landeskriminalamt are detected um, as, as conspicuous and there is one image that would have been wrongly classified, one original that would have been wrongly classified as conspicuous or as a fake as well. Um, here is, uh, for Kirchner, it's the same, all three um, um, fakes from the Landeskriminalamt are detected. Uh, the accuracy um, on the original images is 90.2%, so 9.8% of, of original Kirchners would have been detected wrongly as conspicuous. And here is um, here are the results for Pink, um, which who has a very distinct style. 
and again they aren't quite as good the accuracy on on detecting the fake images is sort of for people who know about metrics it's uh, sensitivity is 67.6 percent um but only 8.5 percent of the originals would have been detected as as fakes as well or as conspicuous and here are again 10 van Gogh's and they these images actually don't come from the Landeskriminalamt Berlin. They come from uh, Professor Henry Kieser from the uh, University of Heidelberg, and they all um, stem from a, a faker who, who discovered that um, Van Gogh's prices rise in the 1930s, and um, uh, they are all images from these um, Wacker brothers. So that's uh, the faker was called Wacker, and there were two brothers. And you can again see that the accuracy on detecting the fakes is with 90% is, is very high. Um, and the wrongly classified originals, there would have been 10.6%. Now, last but not least, I thought, okay, let's try it on um, a very um, controversial image, um, which is um, a Leonardo da Vinci, or is supposed to be a Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. And um, it, it wasn't uh, actually for, for centuries, people have thought that this isn't a da Vinci, it's by one of his pupils, and the provenance of the painting is incomplete and unclear, and in 2004, Christie's declined to sell the painting, presumably because they didn't, didn't think it was a Leonardo. Then in 2017, they did sell it, and it uh, got the record price for $450 million. Um, dollars. Um, so the most expensive picture auctioned ever, and the algorithm says it's a uh, fake um, with the threshold that I sort of calibrated, but it would also, if it is a fake, it would also um, 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 uh, sort of classify 24% of the true Leonardo's as conspicuous which um, is sort of a not very um, yeah, certain result. And um, my conclusion, it, it needs further tests and, and pictures um, and uh, yeah, do more, needs more work to, to really find out whether it's a true Leonardo or not. But um, the indication is that it probably isn't. Well, that's it from my side so far.